we're going to be. We would never do that. So good afternoon. How are we all doing after lunch today? Good. Yeah. 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 Right. If I see anybody sleeping, this is pretty heavy. So <laughs> stay awake. So, as Thelma said, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about containers, but mostly to kind of lay out the landscape um, going on in IT around containers, also virtual machines and cloud management, because there is a ton of, of hype and information out there uh, regarding these technologies. And as a former technology journalist, and now the community uh, liaison for the overt open source project, um, I really have this disdain for hype um, because it is something that fuels the media um, and they feed on it and then they give it all out to you and they kind of go crazy with it. And one of the things that I try to do is to <coughs> hopefully put things in a better perspective. And that's sort of the uh, object of this uh, rambling little talk today. So, here we go. We live. <coughs> Get the right button here. Here, we'll do it this way. There. Okay, sorry. We live in a very operating centric world. Just like Earth is pretty much the center of our universe, and as you can see, we do very well in Mr. and Miss Universe pageants, um, and the rest of the universe can just, you know, they're done. Um, but we at IT, we live in a very operating-centric world. Everything we've done pretty much to date, you know, rotates around the operating system in some way or another. It's never been any different. We've changed the way we get to the operating system. Um, and we've changed how we, you know, manage it. But still, there's been a lot of consistency um, in this um, arena. Now, virtualization, you could argue, is the abstraction of the operating system layer and getting it away from the hardware. And this is true. And this is a big innovation that we've had in recent years. And we're all pretty much familiar with virtualization and how it works and how it can be used effectively in IT. Um, but then beyond that, we move to cloud which is the automation of virtualization and let the apps basically determine their elasticity and go in there and pull in and push out their resources as needed. And those are really, you know, those are two of the big first steps to turning, you know, your physical pieces of iron into virtual machines. Okay, but virtualization is not the be all end all of IT management because even though the machine is virtual, they still need to be managed. Okay? You're still dealing with the operating system and all of the patches and updates and all the inherent administration that you have to have with um, an operating system stack. Everything is there, whether it's you know virtual or you know physical. So, and that's true whether you're using tools to manage your virtual machines like, you know, Overt, which is sort of a, as if you're not familiar with it, it's a virtual machine management platform um, that runs, you know, at data center level um, scalability. Or, you know, something like OpenStack, and RBO is um, Red Hat's OpenStack implementation, which also manages virtual machines at data center levels, except now it's doing it with cloud tools, so you've got elasticity um, and built into the equation. Okay, but for all of this, all of this fancy stuff up here that we talked about, virtualization, you still, as I've said, you're dealing with operating systems. We haven't really gotten away from that yet. Okay, we're starting to. But for, for now, this is where we've been. So we have to contend with all the different problems with operating systems. We have to have you know, configuration management tools in place, like the ones you get from Puppet and Chef and Ansible. These are all, you know, there's a whole ecosystem around the managing of these machines. So in overt, this is a diagram of how overt kind of looks, and it's relatively complex. This is not something that you would want to, you know, 
mess around with too much as far as you know getting into the guts of it. And there's a lot of overhead of virtual machine management. If you look at something like OpenStack, and this is their own diagram, and I apologize for the pixelation, but that's OpenStack's own architecture diagram, and I've been told this is the simplified one. <laughs> yeah. So, and this is, I'm not dissing OpenStack, but it is a very complicated piece of machinery that you have to get in place. And that's been, I think, part of what's been holding it back is that it's very complex and it's very overpowered for what a lot of people need. But back in overt land, which is something I'm a little bit more familiar with, you know, we, you know whether you're dealing with you know, a single host or you've got many data centers, um, virtualization still has its issues, okay? It can be kind of bulky to manage. But now, now, here comes the exciting part. We're actually getting to the point of the conversation. Here, that's where we've been. Here's where we are, okay? Now we're looking at some of these funny little things called containers, okay? And containers are a very interesting piece of technology because now, finally, we're starting to break away from the operating system-centric model. So just as early Renaissance um, philosophers and scientists figured out, you know, that, hey, maybe the Earth isn't the center of the solar system, maybe the sun is. So too are we finding that containers are now application-centric. So if you're not familiar with containers, basically what they are are names, they're restricted namespace um, sets that basically allow you to just have the application and then a few libraries of whatever that application needs, and then that's it. Not an entire operating system. It's not virtualization by any shape, way, shape, or form. Anything else that the container needs, it goes, to, it goes down and talks to the kernel and pulls up what, you know, the tools that it needs from there. So really, from a DevOps point of view, containers are awesome. Because if you're a developer on the DevOps side, now you only have to, you know, code for the application. You just worry about the application, pull in whatever few li special libraries you need, and then, you know, out the door it goes. If you're an you know, administrator on the ops side, it's going to be very attractive for you as well because, you know, with things like Docker, you get a lot of portability. You can just basically pick one up and move it to the other machine or host and you're, you're set to go. So that's, you know, the DevOps model and, and the, uh, has really revitalized containers because containers aren't new. They've been around for quite some time. You know, they've been in the form of um, Solaris Zones and BSD Jails and LXC for Linux. Containers are not new, but DevOps has really revitalized the interest in containers and made them a very attractive piece of technology. There, and in just recent years, we've seen, I wouldn't call it an explosion, but definitely a, a small minor earthquake um, in, in new tools. Docker came along only in 2013. And now we've got Rocket and Red Hat's Project Atomic and CoreOS and Ubuntu Snappy and even Overt is still with containers a little bit. And third party vendors that I'm not even really sure what they do, but they're using containers and they're, they're advertising them. And so this, the last one on the bottom, Clicker, and I'm not really here to diss them at all, but this sort of is like the first sign of what we used to call in the news media cloud washing. Um, back when cloud technologies became really popular, basically everybody and their brother and sister went out and said, hey, we work cloud too. You know, I have a toothbrush that's in the cloud. <laughs> oh, okay, that's great. How many cavities do I have? Well, the cloud now knows. Okay, what did I eat for breakfast? So oh, there, there you go. But that was sort of the hype that was generated. I'm only exaggerating slightly. And people are now starting to do that with containers. Now this isn't really going to be a talk about, you know, the product 
that I work with necessarily as far as hiking them, but I am more familiar with Overt, and I'm definitely more familiar with Project Atomic. So I'm going to use Atomic to show you one way that containers can be managed um, in an IT environment. So what Atomic is, is a minimal Fedora or enterprise Linux um, host, either, and by enterprise Linux, either CentOS or Red Hat Enterprise Linux. <coughs> Excuse me. And what Atomic is basically geared to do, it's a minimal host that allows you to basically orchestrate and manage containers in an environment um, that is more secure and hopefully, you know, more robust than what you get when you just run Docker out of the box. Because Docker is really cool, but right now, you know, and I realize they're still working on it, but Docker is very limited in what it can do in terms of managing itself. You can create containers and you can deploy them and turn them on and off, but that's basically it. There aren't a lot of extra tools running around in just Docker proper. So what Atomic has done, and it's not a separate operating system or anything like that, it's basically collecting a whole bunch of different tools from the upstream, pulling them in and combining them into a cohesive form that ideally will make it easier for people to manage their containers. So obviously part of that equation has to be, as I've been mentioning, Docker itself. So we consume Docker. And we use the inherent you know, tools that are in Docker, the portability within Docker, which has made it really um, very popular over some other container technologies. We are also using a tool that was originally developed um, for GNOME. Um, and now it's been repurposed to use. It's called OS Tree. And if you're not familiar with OS Tree, um, the, the oversimplified way of describing it is that, think of it as, um, it's not really a package manager on its own. We're not replacing RPM at all, or, but we are you know, doing extra things with it. So OS tree, as euphemistically been called, Git for packages. So the idea is that you build your package set, and then you deploy them in a single atomic image. And that's actually where the name atomic comes from. Um, and you, just like Git, you roll that out in a single update, single push out, and, and, and out it goes. The nice thing about this model is that if you make a mistake, um, and as Thomas said, to err, so to speak, if you make a mistake, see, I've got you right here, okay? If you do err, then you can basically, with one command, reverse the whole thing. You pull back the entire atomic update. And just like you would in Git, you just basically roll back the branch and you're set. Now that's OS3, it works hand in hand with RPM. I should mention for those of you who are more interested in Debian, that there is a Deb OS3 out there. It's not necessarily dependent on RPM to work. So there is good work being done with OS3 for the Debian package manager. So it's something that exists Hopefully, it'll be more robust in that ecosystem as well. Another big part of uh, Project Atomic is orchestration. Orchestration is really a tough nut to crack. And in fact, we have, you know, at minimum, we have three tools within Atomic that take care of this. Um, the first is Cockpit. And Cockpit is basically a very nice, simplified, um, graphical interface that basically lets you activate and deactivate containers as needed. So it's pretty simple. You see what you want to turn on, turn it on, there, there's your container running the application or service that you want, and you're set to go. But other orchestration layers are needed as well. For instance, we're also consuming Apache Mesos, which allows you to um, orchestrate um, containers across multiple hosts. Okay, we're also using another orchestration layer from Google, Google Kubernetes. Kubernetes allows us to orchestrate applications that have to be across multiple containers. So there's a lot of different layers that are going on there. And with these tools, 
um, we're hoping that Project Atomic will be a tool that people will look at and they'll you know, want to use uh, for their container management and IT. So between you and me, it sounds like that I've done a pretty fair job of hyping this up on my own. I've, just, you know, I've spent about 10 minutes here talking up containers. So why not containers? What's wrong with this picture? Okay, why can't we just jump on board and move ahead? Because after all, containers are certainly awesome. And that is basically true, except when they're not. And this is the problem that we have to kind of look at with any kind of new technology. And the biggest point that I want to get across to everyone here today um, is if you're interested in containers, or any other solution that I've mentioned for IT. The most important thing is that you know the limitations of that technology. Now certainly, there are some problems with containers. Docker itself, part is, and this is again part of a success story, has mitigated some of those um, problems that containers have. One of the biggest ones is security. Security is a, you know, an issue with containers because of the way they're structured and the way they talk to the kernel. Um, you can have problems of you know, leaky memory processes, which basically um, could lead to vulnerabilities. Um, the way you set up your container, you could have it set up so basically you're affecting effectively running your application as root because it directly has access to the kernel, and so on and so on. Different tools have different ways of taking care of that problem. Um, I was talking to somebody from the Rocket team, and their way is they're going to try to sign all these containers. And you know, with, with actual signing and whatnot, that they believe that that's a strategy that will help them mitigate um, the security issues that could happen with a container. In Project Atomic, we were wrapping um, SE Linux around the whole thing, and we'll use SE Linux policies to hopefully take care of containers that get a little naughty. But we've gone through a lot here. We've gone through, you know, virtualization, the cloud, to containers. And I've talked to several people over the, you know, even recently, in the recent weeks and months, who aren't even really ready to make the jump to virtual. They're still in bare metal. They're not big enough, or they don't want to deal with the overhead. And, and now, you know, and let alone think about something like cloud, let alone think about something like containers. Okay? So this is not a slam on any of these technologies. The important thing is that we, as IT professionals, have to be honest with ourselves about what we need now and what we need in the near-term future. We should not be, you know, suckered or you know, swayed or whatever you want to call it by the next salesperson who comes along and says, this is the greatest shiny thing ever. Resist the shiny. Be honest with yourselves and hopefully understand what you need. You may not need containers. If you're not really interested in getting into a DevOps model of, of development and IT, then maybe that's not what you need you know, to use. Maybe containers are something you can sort of play around with, but maybe what you actually need is a virtual machine. And if you're using virtual machines, do you need cloud? Do you need elasticity? Or can you handle your scaling in a slow and progressive way? In which case, maybe you don't need something as complicated as cloud. But that's for you to decide. You have to look at yourself in the mirror. You have to figure out what it is that you actually need and what is going to be good for you and your IT and your customers in the coming months and years. Plan ahead. So whether you, you know, look at it how you are in the present and how you are in the future. And make sure that you're being really honest with yourself. There is nothing wrong with container technology. It is exciting and new, and I think it has a lot of potential for organizations that truly need it. The same holds true for cloud. The same thing holds true for virtualization. 
And if you are honest with yourself, I think you will find that you will have less headaches moving forward and you will have resisted the container hype. Because basically, the philosophy is this. Just because you can build with any tool, such as this nicely built car with Legos, doesn't necessarily mean that's the best way. So, with that, are there any questions? We have plenty of time for questions. If you're using a container management already, or maybe not, or we're thinking about it. Um, so, um, are you basically saying that containers are like an alternative to operating systems? In, in a way, yes. I mean, they, they, it's funny you say it quite like that because that's what sparked this talk when we launched Project Atomic last summer. One of, uh, several reporters in the audience said, does this mean that operating systems are dead? Which is not what you said. Um, but. And that sort of led to this whole thought that I had about, you know, is it? I think that in certain situations, containers, especially for a DevOps environment, can be an alternative for operating systems. You still have to have the operating system underneath. Um, that is actually one of the advantages of containers, their portability across different systems, but they're also, that's a disadvantage because they still all have to be Linux if you're running Docker. And it has to be homogeneous environment, so that's a problem there. So the operating system is still there, you just sort of abstracted one more layer up, and then you, do, you as a developer, if, if that's what you're doing, you don't have to worry about the operating system as much. You don't, if somebody makes a patch to the operating system, as long as Docker's running and still steady, your container will be just fine. Okay, because I was going to ask how they manage operating system things like, uh, you know, who gets control of the processor and, and what about shared memory. But you're saying that the operating system is still there. Right, because they, uh, containers are, you know, they're, they're sort of an offshoot of the Linux kernel, you know, at least in Docker land. Um, you know, in Solaris with zones, you know, they're dealing with the Solaris kernel. So yeah, there's so, there still has to be that connection there. You can't run them independently. And unfortunately, you know, they're, as I've said, they're self-contained on that operating system. If I have a Docker container, I pretty much have to run it on a Linux machine. If I want to run it on Windows, I have to run a, a, I have to run the virtual machine on top of Windows and put the container in there. All right. One more question. Okay, uh, I was looking at the tools and uh, support provided by Docker, right? Docker provides now launch Docker Swarm, Docker Machine D, Docker Compose. What they're trying to do is that they're trying to convert a container, managing it like a virtual machine, actually VM. And then there is another project going on, OSV, or Mirage OS by Zen. So how do you see the future of those versus this efforts? Yeah, if I didn't take too long with this, I would back up to that slide and show it because like, you know, Rocket, um, and, and then Docker's enterprise uh, product that they have um, are definitely tools like Atomic and CoreOS that are there to, you go ahead and turn, yeah, um, to, to, to manage that. I think that this gets into the manage your expectations point, uh, point that I was trying to make earlier. You need to understand the difference between how, you know, running the whole virtual machine versus running the container. Because superficially from the outside, it looks very similar. You know, if I, you know, if I, if I have a, you know, if I go to docker.io and I start up an Ubuntu container or a CentOS container and it's running the entire operating system within, how is that different from a virtual machine? And so, we have to figure that out. You know, how is how is that? How are the resources managed? How does that make things work um, within our IT? So it's a complicated question. I think that the future basically means that what we're going to be um, end up seeing is a lot of consolidation. I think you're going to see virtual management tools like Zen and Overt start managing containers, and I wouldn't be too surprised if you had, you know, tools like Docker and whatnot starting to look at handling virtual machines. 
I think that people are going to start making the consolidation moves. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Brian. Please. Big hand, Brian.